Okay. Uh, so um, I hope all you guys are well into exercise one and uh, and two. You should be out of one uh, really because uh, now exercise two B uh, is what we are going to introduce today. Uh, the re- the exercise two B is related to uh, exercise two A, which we introduced to you. In some sense, it's uh, uh, similar in its logic, but at a much more intimate scale of daily life and uh, the places that we inhabit more. Somebody's mic is on. Can all of y'all switch off your mics, please? Uh, there's a lot of disturbance. Yeah. So uh, uh, exercise 2B really looks at similar kind of logics. Uh, at a much more intimate scale, the scale at which we perform our daily, our daily lives. And uh, I think somebody is doing this on purpose. It's very, very properly timed. Uh, <laughs> every time I stop, it goes away. And then when I start, it comes again. It's superb. Uh, well, so yeah, just to continue that exercise 2B will look at, uh, 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 will look at our, the scale of our environment uh, and that of our daily lives. And so what we are asking you to do is to uh, think about a practice that you observe in the world around you. Uh, and this would be in, and this would be in and around your home, in the neighborhood in which you live, perhaps the Mohalla or even in the vicinity uh, in the city that you are in, but not, uh, not only where you live. Uh, but it is something that you've experienced, seen, noticed, uh, have been intrigued by. It could be uh, the Chaiwala at the corner and uh, uh, what, what, he, uh, what are the things that he does day in and day out. Maybe the first chai that he throws on the road and you might have been intrigued as to why that happens. And the tools that he uses, uh, the things that are uh, arranged by him or her, uh, in order to make a place uh, uh, that is that corner that uh, we see in so many of our cities. You might even take uh, something much closer to you. Uh, Yesterday, we were discussing with one of you all about the act of Rangoli. Uh, of doing this every day at your doorstep, just outside the threshold, in a manner with uh, your mother, uh, uh, something that has been practiced day in and day out. You recognize that there were patterns that were repetitive and there were departures which were made uh, a certain difference. Uh, That was a a personal exploration of mood, perhaps. But that this is tied with the threshold of the house, that it is tied perhaps with the thought, perhaps with an outside, uh, which is specific. It is tied to certain kind of rituals and certain kind of festivals. Uh, it may be also tied to certain types of meetings, gatherings, guests come, etc. So you might want to look at that. You might also want to look at uh, uh, other kind of practices that uh, you have noticed, uh, which are not uh, this close, may have to do with uh, uh, the cycle uh, shop or the meat shop or the uh, uh, or the way that uh, uh, let's say the street food vendor uh, occupies space, the way markets are formed. These may all be things that are the, uh, the, uh, the, the areas that you consider uh, when you look for the practices that are around you. Now, what you have to do is with that practice, you have to identify the tools uh, that are used in order, to, uh, in order to carry out that and to complete those. Uh, also the materials. Uh, so those are the two, the tools and the materials that are used in that practice. So whether it is a chalk or the, the color of a rangoli or whether it is, or, you know, stumps of trees that are used as tools for the chai gala, whether it is the tarpaulin, all of this is things that you will identify and think about. And you will think of then about uh, the kind of place that is made through these practices, these tools and materials. And what that place really does uh, for the city. So this is what the exercise is. There's no uh, 
uh, I don't have a presentation today because I, this was implied in the presentation made with when we were talking about geography. Uh, when I showed you, let's say, the plow, which has both, uh, I mean, it does something very local, but it also changes the topography in some sense. Here you have to think about uh, something that is quite small and intimate and done repetitively uh, and how it makes place. So I'll, I'll end with that. Professor Chaya Sadipto, if you all would like to come in. Uh, yeah, um, it might be useful to take one specific example. <clears throat> so let's take the practice of cutting, cutting, let's say, vegetables. And in the south, I don't know if you've seen it, there is a little small contraption on which you can cut vegetables going like this. You don't hold the knife in your hand. It is mounted on a kind of a stool and you cut vegetables like that. Or it has another part to it on the other side in which you can take a coconut and shred the, the uh, innards of the coconut into a kind of a pulp. On the other hand, you have a knife. And the knife means that you hold the knife in one hand and the vegetable in another hand. And you can cut. So you pull the knife towards yourself. And you use the thumb as the kind of stop of the knife. Still third way of cutting is to have a cutting board. And then you put the whatever vegetable it is and you go chop, 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 chop and you cut the vegetable like that. Now, the connections. The one where you use both your hands to hold the vegetable and cut does not require you to have any specific platform on which it is put. And it requires you to sit down on the ground, to squat on the ground. This has implications both or connections both to the kind of vegetables that you use. Um, for example, I'm thinking um, we, can, we cannot cut, uh, let's say, um, Brussels sprouts on that, on that contraption, or it would be very difficult, or a cauliflower. Um, so certain kinds of vegetables that come into your area are connected to the tool. Certain postures of work are also connected to the tool. And therefore, it is connected to the kind of space in which you work. Basically, the floor becomes the most important element with that. Which means that your floor shouldn't be too cold for you to sit on. So it connects to climate, it connects to flora and fauna, it connects to uh, the manner in which you are used to holding your body in posture. And it therefore connects to everything that is related to making space. And just that one instrument brings together a series of lines of relationship. And uh, as opposed to that, if you have a chopping board, it's, it's probably somewhere where you do stand to work, where it is not so easy to, um, to it's too cold perhaps to sit on the ground. Also your clothes are of a kind that don't make it very comfortable to sit on the ground. Just imagine wearing jeans and trying to use that South Indian cutting instrument. Um, tight jeans, I mean. Um, so all those things are connected. And there's an entire way of life which is connected to every instrument 
or tool that one uses. Um, this can be translated into other realms. I took the simple one of domestic work. But I could take the idea of uh, mixing ingredients, for example. And there are many ways of mixing ingredients. Um, you will notice that I tend to harp a lot on cooking, which is not so good when you're doing <laughs> this kind of stuff. But for example, um, there was once a project on which we had concrete and it had to be mixed to a certain um, consistency in order to achieve both the density and the workability. And what happened was that there were two, two people on the site who were looking after this. The younger brother had made boxes of the right size according to his engineering training, which told exactly how much of aggregate sand and cement would go into each, each rotation of the, of the mixer. But the older brother, much older to him, he would just sit on one side and he would take lumps of the mixed material and press it in his hands like this and say, oh yes, yeah, now it's okay. Now it's okay. And he never measured. So the tools that these two people were using, one was a sensorial tool, the hand, but straight. But the other was a measuring tool. And these two implied a kind of notion of the world which leads to many, many things. One notion of the world is everything is separated, everything is proportioned in a certain way, and then it's brought together and it's mixed. But the other notion says um, everything flows one into the other. And at a certain point, I get a sort of consistency, which is correct. And therefore, the tool which you use for testing something is a tool by which you are implying one, an objectified and analytical manner of looking at the world. And on the other side, an embodied manner of, of testing the world. And I think these two, yesterday it was very interesting that uh, uh, Mr. Achiawati uh, talked about, what was it, rheology or some such thing. And I looked it up and they look at food and the, the consistency, viscousness, etc. of food. And there are scientific parameters by which they define every food. And I was sort of like, you know, I was completely... I couldn't take it anymore because the other way is what I'm used to. So there was a, a cultural difference in the manner of using a tool. But that is not the main point that I would like to make. The main point is every tool tells us a story about a world and a story about a view of the world, both the world that it exists in and the view of the world that it privileges. You know, uh, one very interesting example is the saw. You know, the typical saw with which we cut wood. Now, in the European system, the saw teeth are angled away from you. So, the cutting happens when you push away from you. And all the eastern saws from India up to Japan have the teeth in the other direction. And every time you pull towards you, it cuts. Now, the difference is both in the texture of the cut that you get, but also the kind of view of your relationship to wood and your relationship to your tool. And I think this is something which this exercise should bring out. It should bring out, one, the context in which, or 
context created by the tool, the view of the world created by the tool, the, the practice in which that tool is situated, and what that says about an entire uh, system of places. So I think that's, uh, Riaz, we can, we can discuss this further, Sudipto, anybody, and then we can bring out some more things. It also reminds me of the, the way, sorry, Ayaz, go ahead. No, 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 go for it, go for it, sorry. So it also reminds me about, uh, you know, the, the way that uh, one looks at uh, machines, uh, I mean, uh, as one type of tool, we assume that the, the motor car, the automobile is, uh, is a kind of uh, uh, homogeneous category, it's a car. But you know, when you went, when you go to buy a car, you will first think about a German car. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, what your budget is. And then very soon you'll realize that it's probably out of budget because they make things in a particular way. And uh, they, there's an entire culture and a history to Germany that uh, results in something like a Mercedes or a, or a BMW. And it's similar with uh, guns and it's similar with uh, all kinds of things. I mean, uh, when you do a forensic, uh, the manner in which the bullet leaves the gun uh, actually can, 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 dis can, can discern who the murder is. One can tell from which gun the bullet has been shot. And there is, and, and I think that it is that kind of looking, uh, of of getting behind the tool itself, and connecting it to uh, the worlds that created, as Professor Chaya put it, and the world ahead that it looks for. So I just thought those two examples may be useful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, sorry, I you were saying. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, I just had a small point about, you know, uh, I was, uh, I mean, when, when Professor Shai was, uh, you know, talking about, I was also wondering about the injuries created by tools, right? Like about, uh, like how that is so symptomatic of the kind of tool usage, like, uh, I, I mean, uh, you know, one of the most uh, sad things about, I guess, uh, you know, our generation is that the, our injury of using the tool is this little hard spot you get over here uh, from using the mouse. Right. Uh, and uh, it's so different from like, say, someone who'd have like, you know, an arm cut off working in a sawmill or, uh, you know, I mean, the, the tools of the trade and the kind of, uh, uh, I mean, the one, one also assumes that the tools make the mark, but the, to the, but the tools also mark us, uh, you know, it's some sort of a symbiosis. So I think, uh, I mean, even to consider the relationship of injuries with uh, or what the mark the tool leaves on the person. Um, it's also kind of interesting to see how that's changed across generations as well. All kinds of corns and blisters. Yeah, <laughs> back pain and all. <laughs> sitting on a laptop chair. <laughs> I think, uh, Professor Chaya, both the examples that you gave were for cutting. But there are, I think there's a, a practice of uh, splicing, joining, uh, bending, uh, pruning, scraping. All of these practices are, I, I think, once once you kind of get into the exercise, the whole act of doing something would also kind of emerge from uh, looking at such activities. Of, of, but always something bodily. I think, you know, the minute it becomes mechanical, it, uh, I think the, 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 the whole idea, not, I, would, I wouldn't say mechanical altogether, but I think, you know, let's say a dishwasher, for example, is, is not a tool that we would necessarily interested in exploring. Um, but Riaz was talking about this whole idea of the machine and how that machine is appropriated. And there is also this idea of Jugaad, which I don't know if this is a good uh, idea to kind of bring that in. Uh, but it happens a lot in uh, Delhi, uh, particularly with uh, the Sikh community, uh, because they're also fond of cars. They're also fond of imported cars, Mercedes, Benzes, and whose parts they cannot afford. And then they are, find innovative ways of uh, replacing those parts and so on. Uh, one of the ways that uh, you know I've, I've I have uh, witnessed this firsthand is um, the use of haldi to close off a radiator burst in an ambassador car. I mean, you just uh, if there's a radiator leak, then you just add haldi to the in into the tank and it blocks off. 
and it's 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 kind of incredible that this kind of thing also happens and i i want to who first figure this out but the idea of also using a washing machine to make lassi and other kinds of things are, are these are these are happening all the time which is also very interesting how how things are appropriated in a manner that is uh, beyond the tool and uh, towards something else but i think i think we are venturing into something uh, quite different here so uh, probably be careful in reining it back yeah you know the it's interesting to see uh, what is the set of tools for example if you see an old time carpenter at least in gujarat i know they will come with a small theli a bag cloth bag in which there will be one saw one planer one chisel one triangle or or uh, the the one like that, that yeah and uh, then perhaps uh, a, a sharpening stone that's all there will be and a tape that's all there is in in his bag and he uses his entire body to become the vice in which the wood is held and to use the tools on it and so the relationship of the body to the thing being worked on also generates the the paraphernalia of tools and you will notice that with the least tools the the maximum effect can be achieved but you also can get very elaborate um uh, workshops where there are and there are all kinds of tools available now in one there is precision an absolute um, repetition uh, uh, repeatability of every uh, every element but in the other there is the connection with each piece of wood which which mediates and which modulates the way in which the carpenter can actually cut that wood and maybe he leave out some part or maybe he will do something else with that part so because it is not in it so there is no standardization of procedure there is the the lesser the tools the more the the impact of the interrelationships the more the tools the lesser the uh, interrelationships affect and all industrial processes try to reduce the interrelationships to a bare minimum so that they cannot be be you know um, they they don't worry if you are getting this or that uh, it either it will simply reject the material or say okay still we can work on it and the same thing happens to the humans who work in such industrial processes that there aren't specific human beings with special capacities and capabilities but there are only human beings who can be taught to do anything that the machine or the or the industry demands so the human becomes modular just as the material becomes modular the tool becomes modular all aspects are fragmented or analyzed into their component possibilities whereas the single tool or a couple of tools will make um it possible to do all kinds of things with the same tool but you only change the procedure so there is a tool there is a procedure procedure comes from a world view how things should be done and and what should they achieve the world view also says we must achieve absolute um unchanging precision which is um repeatable versus which says yeah of course every pot will be slightly different the, the you know when the when the wheel is used for making pottery um 
And I was amazed when I first saw the machine switch do that, you know, that, that lump of clay spins and there's a machine which cuts like that and removes the, the clay. And I, was, I, I, I couldn't believe it, that one could, could uh, make the, the whole process of making a pot so precise. So I think we have to look at that also, that um, the central vista belongs to the category of precision or a clarity of a certain kind which is based in um, the, the universalization of space. Whereas the, the um, local practices or the practices of everyday life always try to overcome that that uh, flattening that is there. So the tools are a very interesting way of finding an entry into uh, a much um, modulated surface of existence rather than a flattened existence. Uh, there's also one uh, very interesting point around, uh, I mean, this had actually surfaced something that Hussain actually uh, had mentioned to us in one of the labs uh, he was talking about the difference between industrial processes and craft processes. And uh, he said, like, you know, one of the main, uh, one of the main points in humanities actually comes down to uh, the, the amount of alienation. So it's actually, uh, if you have unalienated labor, uh, that becomes a craft process. And if you have a, a level of alienation with, uh, with either tool, material process, ecosystem, you know, uh, any of those kind of components, it essentially results in an industrial process. Uh, so it's exactly what you're, uh, I mean, what you're saying, it's a beautiful analogy. So <laughs> what is the mean, aspect it, of skill? What's the aspect of skill and emotion within this whole thing? Because with the tool comes a skill also, right? Yes. Well, um, if a task is broken down into many parts, you can learn, learn a specific skill and that will be sufficient for the task that you have taken up. Yeah. Um, you will achieve precision in just that skill. But if the, if uh, you are in a, another mode, then the paucity of tools often leads to a, uh, extension of skill into different things. And our carpenters are very, very good examples of that. With few tools, they are able to achieve a great complexity of work because they have trained their eyes, their hands, their bodies to um, negotiate the material with the few tools rather than learn specific skill for every task. So your, your, your emotion is what at that time? That it is left open to find that this piece of wood is giving me trouble here. Therefore, what do I do with it? And there is an, a kind of uh, intelligence of negotiating that material. Uh, that gives great satisfaction. In the other case, the satisfaction comes from achieving a prescribed result. You know, I also think that, I mean, if I uh, look at skill, I mean, uh, it, it, in terms of a definition, it, uh, it's the ability to do something well. Uh, and I think that uh, there is there are two sides to it. There is, uh, I can, uh, over time, uh, uh, skills get codified as well because there's a larger group of people who do it. And within that community uh, of people, let's say carpenters, uh, there is a certain external benchmark that this is what a good skill is. But there's an internal one, I think, that drives one to do something well. And that is the care and the... Uh, uh, the care and the relationship one has with the material and the purpose for which one is shaping it. 
and i think that internal care leads to a kind of uh, leads to workmanship uh, which would uh, uh, you know kind of uh, uh, determine how well it gets done so i think that's the, that's partly where the the world of emotion and the world of uh, a, a, a more kind of immersed uh, uh, relationship with material uh, is that's the area i i don't know how else to talk about it but uh, i think that it's unless there is an internal need to do something well uh, that emotional uh, i can't always of course sometimes when 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 one is uh, uh one has to do something uh, then the external referent is very very uh, useful uh, you know that i know that i have to learn earn a navy uh, in order to i have to earn a living uh, and i have to make 30 chairs by the end of the month uh, that care might be there in the first three or four uh, but the benchmark will allow me to replicate it a little bit and push it further so i think there's this both this internal and external side to Uh, to skill which is also something else real um you know i know two superb model makers in ahmedabad you know architectural models and they can work in wood and they can do fantastic models really superb now the two brothers one is um sort of thick set and like uh, you know activity and the other looks like actually a um, scholar a um, very thin fine features horn rimmed glasses and you should see their work same piece of wood or similar pieces of wood you give them and ask them to plane it one of them will come out with a plain surface which is really beautifully plain but which shows every every fiber and every hole in the wood and the other guy will plane it so that you get a smooth surface completely smooth and the all models even you can see the difference between the two guys models i've had opportunity where i was giving the same thing i needed many things to be put into one large model and they were making you know the buildings and the buildings made by one guy had a kind of a um, chewable quality and the other was was pristine and their satisfactions were different that the one guy would take this and throw it at you and say see and the other guy would be caressing the wood and saying see and i think their their whole makeup in the skill that they learned it it branched out into two kinds of emotional satisfactions the tool being the same now we have gone far from the subject of the exercise by the way <laughs> because the subject of the exercise is what kind of a world view does a does a tool imply what kind of a world does it imply what that kind of a world view does it imply and uh it is very difficult to say only one world view but i think a degree of over simplification will be required in doing this exercise it won't be so so uh, true if i might use that term you know because i can always prove another example i have a um. question yeah i was just uh, wondering just a quick point uh, as uh, uh, i thought maybe it's a good exercise to do uh, you know before jumping into building scenarios and the world view it could be nice to build a mind map you know where uh, where one puts the tool in the center and then builds a entire uh, you know interconnected kind of a network of web around this tool which uh, you know talks to gender talks to uh you know uh, its place in the home talks to you know uh, the materials uh, the kind of the uh, you know where where one procures this tool so it's uh, the full world view uh, which i think will then uh, allow uh, you know the exercise to become fairly well informed by many many things uh, around it so there's just a suggestion for uh, yeah it's a great idea one other thing that i uh, think is interesting about the tool is in the in the moment of the use of the tool there is no ego 
they, there is no personal self. You are almost one with an engagement of, uh, of a certain kind, uh, which is a little bit different from even a painting that an artist might be doing, uh, where there are moments where a sense of an expectation might creep in, uh, in the creation of, uh, of whatever artwork is being created, that there is a sense of a, of a reputation to be upheld. Um, and I was, while we were talking about the skill, this was something that I was thinking, whether that actually happens in a moment where you are completely immersed in the tool and the tool may be thought of as a paintbrush as well. I'm not saying that the paintbrush is not a tool, uh, but in the moment of the tool, I think there is a, a breakdown that happens of the self, which is to me very interesting. Geraldine, you wanted to say something or ask something. Uh, yeah. So, well, because of uh, this uh, lockdown situation, uh, like I, well, I, I'm, I'm not able to walk around uh, that much, but I have a, uh, my question goes to, uh, so now our lives kind of be more online and my community is of textiles, well, person that loves textiles mostly. <laughs> so um, I'm wondering, like this whole lockdown situation has bring a lot of people to to weave and to use the materials that are made in Mexico. So all the, uh, a lot of materials like from cotton that weren't done before the lockdown have been increasing, like also the wool products and you know, like all the uh, industry, uh, it's a really low, it's not an in industrial production in the sense that I can't make a, a thousand scarf in one month. I can do only one in three months, no? And there are a lot of people that are weaving and knitting and doing all these kind of things. And so the people that in Mexico do these materials are, 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 are like, why are you buying so much when before you didn't do it, you know? So they are making so much uh, var variants of these uh, products. So maybe, I think that will be interesting to put it like in a paper, you know, like also the tools the, um, for crocheting. They, uh, there are like the carpenters that here are beginning to do it because of the demand of these new, new products here in Mexico. So can I use that even though it's not like in my, like in my surroundings, but in my real like community of, yeah, people, weavers around me? As long as you know about it and you, you can give that information across, I think you can use that example. Okay. Okay. So. Or, yeah, or like the weaving situation in Chiapas that I know, like all the process and all the, like the, um, like the indigenous perspective of, or the, of the weaving of that tool and all the materials. I think that will be like more enriching for, to, to communicate, I, I think, I don't know. Okay, just to, okay. But also, it also means that there is, there are many things to this now. The kind of fibers that you are able to get in, in that geography. Um, which would be different from the fibers, let's say China got like silk or which yeah. would be different so you would have wool and you would have um, things of that sort and so that that relates to the climate that re relates to the topography everything then it also requires different members of the community to do different things so the beaver is dependent on somebody who dyes the threads perhaps I don't know the process, but so there will be connections of that kind. Then there will be connections of exchange that, for example, um, uh, st still going back to that, the, the materials uh, in cut, for example, there was one plant which was used to, to be a kind of not a chemical, but its juices 
were useful for bringing out certain colors. And as the as the the woodland diminishes, there it is more and more difficult to get that plant. And therefore, they are looking for other ways to color. But so then uh, it becomes a completely different game. Mm. Up to then, it was just you went out of your house, walked a little bit into the farm, and then the, the room, and you found that plant, and you brought that plant, cut it, and brought it. But now it means you've got to buy, etc. So it it changes uh, the whole thing. But the tools that are used still remain similar, more or less similar. Maybe they develop a little. Bit. So I think you have to look at the community, you have to look at the geography, and you have to look at the relations between material and humans that build up this kind of tool and practice, which build up the practice with the tools available. Thank you. There's a question regarding um, how it ties back to Delhi or to the river. How do we connect this tool and ident identifying of tool to Delhi? You know, the one very good answer that most people use is that that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> and then not answer it. So let's not do that. Um, the purpose of this exercise, ultimately we'll have to look at Delhi also. But remember, we are looking at a place which should bring all voices and all kinds of practices into view. We are not flattening the picture of the nation in this alter ego. The alter ego is something that says many practices make up this land. And therefore the practices that you bring might have some relation to the kind of program that develops. That's one part of it. But the second part of it is that understanding the relationship between tool, practice and context is a way of understanding how we will look at the site. In what way will we look at the site? And there I think there will be, uh, once this understanding is developed, so it's a two, two-fold thing. One is the whole of India wants to be seen there, or understood there, or listened to there, not just uh, the infinitesimal fraction of those who think this is what it is. And the second thing is that the general understanding of tool, practice and context allows us to understand our site as not just that delimited piece of land, but as a set of practices which could have developed there, which may have developed there, which may have been suppressed there and which may need some kind of a re-emergence. Yeah, that's how I would look at it. I had a question, Professor Chai. Um, like, I mean, uh, I mean, I just want uh, interested in knowing your thoughts about uh, do are tools political? I mean, do does do tools have implicit politics? Uh, I mean, would they create hierarchies? Would they? Um, or is this hierarchies? Just your thoughts on that. Of course there are. But you see, there is the, you have to look at the whole complex of things. There, there is geography, there are social relations, there are uh, access to materials, etc. And, and the tool plays a particular part in it. Mm -hmm. So that certain practices um, express the politics that is prevalent. Yeah. Now, that politics, uh, broadly, you can see uh, some patterns of it. 
One is where there is a, a need or a felt um, need to, to unify into some known modes, defined modes. And the other is to leave the individual agents free to uh, sort of fight it out, interact, uh, cooperate, compete, etc. Yeah? And the scale of these, at what scale? So one very important thing that the tool does is at what scale is it possible for you to be different from somebody who is similar to you, who is doing the same kind of practice? Mm -hmm. And in that sense, the tool is a way of suggesting a particular politics of relationship. It is also something where many other politics are encoded. Certain tools um, will only be used by men and not by women. And that's one of the terrible things about tools, that they start getting associated with or they become the agents for um, uh, pushing certain um, uh, um, chisms or certain power relations in a society. And in that sense, every tool has to be seen very carefully again and again as to whether it is, for example, just imagine if you see the, the, the clothes and equipment that are given to, uh, let's say, a person who works in a refinery versus the clothes and equipment which are given to a municipal worker. And you will see that the municipal worker is given no tools at all. There's not even a, a stick, a sharp stick with which she can, uh, you know, poke the, the plastics and sort of dump them in her bag. She has to pick it up with her hands. And that, I think the lack of tools is suggestive of a certain um, hierarchy <coughs> relation. Um, and I think this is like lawyers, just see the kind of clothes and everything, or, or architects for that matter. Yeah? Uh, there, is, there is a dress code of a certain kind, which others are not allowed to have. Yeah? So the tools are, I think also, they tell everybody that this guy is just a cleaner here. Yeah? Huh? Um, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, that, that reminds me of uh, TMK's, uh, uh, TM Krishna's book, Sebastian and Sons, yeah. where he talks about the Mirdangam and through the making of the instrument and the tool, he mm. goes through different trades and then talks about caste systems and uh, mm. talks about all kinds of mm. urban environments and where they were in the city and the politics of the urban environments. And he connects it to a larger system like that. Um, but you just uh, see uh, that uh, um, in most organizations in India, only the peons will have will have uh, uh, uniforms. Uh, then there is an explanation given that because you know they they can't afford good clothes, so which means that you are paying them so less that they can't afford clothes, and therefore you give them uniforms. All others can come without uniforms. Huh? So that means that you are considering a class of people as unskilled, dispensable, modularized, and the other as individuals. So you, um, it is only through their social actions that those people can promote themselves as individuals, as we have seen on SEPT camps. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I just wanted to, uh, Professor Chaya. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, uh, I just wanted to, um, I mean, uh, add something here, like, uh, what I understand basically tool is, uh, I mean, it's, uh, something which we, uh, use basically to convert a thought or an idea to give an expression to a thought or an idea. 
so uh, sometimes when for example somebody is feeling violent he'll use a sort of whatever you know to show the violence it will be it will become a tool of you know um, i mean weapon or something of that sort if someone wants to express art it becomes a chiseling tool for the sculptor so uh, when we are talking of the caste systems as vignesh he brought up so probably like it's interesting to explore that the different castes how the different tools you know they were associated with different castes and also like as we uh, try to understand there was a certain um, you know the uh, like without getting into i mean there is a certain a sort of refinement in thinking and this refinement it expresses itself i mean it also assumes a form of expression so uh, somehow i mean it started with that ideal kind of uh, you know thinking but obviously it took a pretty much distorted shape when we talk of the caste in india uh, because uh, somewhere i had read like even plato initially like uh, when he was uh, expressing his um, this ideal society i mean even he had given some sort of demarcation based on the different you know um, like it's uh, it works better when it is more organized in terms of different you know uh, the kind of work people are engaging themselves with because it gives them a certain scope to um, strive for excellence in that particular you know uh, field to go more and more deeper into that which if for example one person engages in uh, with lots of things together might not be able to get to the depth especially when it we talk of some uh, sort of research and studies and uh, more so um, now uh, as you are talking of the tools now given to the uh, like people so initially there was an acquired tool and after that then the tools they started like you know um, it's it's just uh, because i am not able to like uh, understand it very well in terms of the exercise which we are discussing here so if you can just elaborate more in terms of that like how we are supposed to approach for yes. this exercise i would suggest that at first the sheer functionality of the tool and the manner in which it it promotes a certain kind of practice in a certain context in a certain geographical physical material context that is where we should begin then this additional layers of meaning that come on to it or which become associated with it is something which is more complex which we can look at once you have mapped as as uh, ayas said mapped all the relations related to that tool and that practice of material of geography of community etc etc yeah after that we can look at from there where did it go in terms of meaning or in terms of the politics of it or in terms of uh, the value given to it so um i think um, one of the things noticeable in india is the less tools you have to use the higher you are you know if you can just speak like me and be a teacher i need not have anything but that then i'm i'm put at the highest level because uh, he only has to use his mind yeah and if i have to use my hands then it is a degradation of a certain kind now those things are something which you are talking about which i think the first part of the exercise try to remain close to the actual tool and the practice and its geography yeah huh? because that will give you a lot of insight into the origins of differentiation but the differentiation then becomes more a uh, a manner of creating hierarchy so we are we are looking at the origins of practices if you see what i mean and we are assuming a sort of <coughs> an i which doesn't yet know about all the bad things that it has done for the moment or good things that it has done. like refinement you talked about so 
we 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 keep it open ended in that area but we look really at what is the practice what are the tools used what does that do to body what does that do to to the use of the geography of that place and what kind of space comes about that i think keep it in that that rather limited frame for the time being you know manse what we had thought when uh, we were thinking through this exercise is that actually it was meant to be very simple you were supposed to take a walk outside your house see something that interests you a practice uh, and simply then uh, look at it more carefully and if i take that a little bit further that it is something that happens reasonably every day uh, that you notice that interests you and you think is important and makes place it's as simple as that really Uh, and the meaning part of it will come when it comes uh, but really the the thing is first uh, to uh, to kind of simply identify it uh, and then take it from there does it have to happen every day or it's like no no i mean every day is a is a way of speaking but uh, regularly it is not a, it is not a festival it is not a, a annual uh, it's not an annual kind of thing it has to be uh, i don't know I, I, every day no but it has to be regular i don't know how else to put it uh, uh, like uh, uh, sorry i mean i you also said something like rangoli you know making rangoli outside yeah, the house yes uh, which is very much a practice in south india like they call it kolam yes. in the mm, region yes. where so yes yeah there it's daily but it may be that in gujarat it is only once a year on new year's day right okay till now i was looking at i used to cut glass uh, with the diamond cutter and make lamps out of it till now i was thinking of you know doing that is that had a very important relationship to me and the tool was only the glass cutter and the hammer and everything uh the way the glass used to cut depended on your stroke and your concentration and your uh i would not say skill but it was the moment because yeah. if the moment is wrong the it's lost uh but now it's not regular or every day i thoda confused uh, so uh, no but that's a, that's a practice which you could use it every day were you required to do so it is not yeah. kind of a high polluted um, uh, sort of uh, symbolic no it's um, not and it's there is no geography so i don't know so, so. no there is a geography where did it, the, where did the diamond the immediate come? environment yeah no where did the diamond come from there oh has, the origin of the geography okay the the diamonds have to come from africa Yeah, huh? industrial diamonds mostly come from there, and for that you need an entire entire paraphernalia. You need mafias. You need uh, the what it the beers. You need all kind, and you need colonialism. And actually, you start seeing that that practice of cutting glass is dependent on international relations. just as glass itself is now if you go into glass and you say i need uh, uh, sand for making glass but i also need soda ash now soda ash uh, it comes mainly from one lake at the border of kenya and tanzania and thousands of tons of soda ash are are uh, Um, exported and we buy it for making glass and there will be so many tiny tiny things like that which build up the picture of glass and of the diamond cutter then the use of your hand which might be that you need also a kind of ruler along which you pull the straight line and the kerosene <laughs> yeah so that adds another dimension now i realize yeah, yeah. so process yeah. is a practice which is uh, connected to global phenomena yeah. 
is not connected so much to the local geography except that the shops in which you buy the glass and the shops in which you buy the diamond cutter and the whole uh, sort of trade infrastructure that is a very local one because you will find that there will be one wholesaler in mumbai and then or or 10 maybe and there will be hundreds of little shops and that is a different animal altogether um, which is which is giving you different choices yeah? Yeah. so that practice is related to the organization of a society which is a context the but so yeah yeah okay, picking up corridors of power usually the rubber stamp becomes the most powerful tool so can we consider that also as a yes sure and, Sure. Yeah. yeah, I was uh, thinking the same thing about the central vista. Like, I mean, in in the in the parliament building, actually, your mic, uh, you know, I mean, and how you could subvert that mic, basically. Like, if you could strategically put someone's mic off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hacker. Hacker. And moment pitch. <laughs> in fact now even these all these uh, twitter handles and everything can also be considered as a tool like social media because it's also organizing society somewhere you know i mean let's, the blogs let's stick to physical tools please yes? because mm -hmm. otherwise the, the possibilities are endless and it doesn't really help us to understand uh, our project a little more Hmm? so uh, physical tools uh, should we also like uh, there is a time period which would be well something that you are what familiar with you know enough about so a lifetime i mean whatever we have lived no no now i know what my grandmother used to do okay yeah and i've read descriptions of what how van gogh used to paint it's like it's not as limited but it has to be a material practice it has to have physical tools i think that that is something where i would i would be a little more um, yes mm -hmm. that no no abstract systems have to be studied mm -hmm. so for example if i took the rubber stamp Uh, which was just now mentioned the rubber stamp can be of anything it can be uh, something which is tested tested okay tested okay tested okay and it can also be something which says uh, um uh date stamp yeah now these are two different things which are happening with the rubber stamp but the rubber stamp is as a physical tool it is not really doing anything i would be a little hesitant about using the rubber stamp i would be um it's like saying that um how is the pen a different kind of tool from a rubber stamp and how if i was given a marker instead of a two uh, of a pen or if i was given a, a a quill you know with a feather instead of a pen what would be the change in the way in which i connected to my environment for example in order to use a quill i don't need an industry which makes pens i can take a twig and sharpen it even i need to make ink so again the scale of of organizing the practice will vary according to the tool the world that is called in by the tool will be of a different scale yes 
that was very profound the world that is called in by the tool varies yes yes sure that changes yes. yes no i think that's really important because like for example you were talking about just cutting glass and one was able to draw in an entire world system whereas if i was talking about making matka uh, i might be able to talk about a world system but it would be in a very different way because i would talk about yesterday's silt and then i would have to talk about rivers but i would have a very se- a physical sense of connection uh, with all of that and perhaps have also an imagination which is parallel to it as we have with when we think about the yamuna or the ganga but when i have to think about let's say diamond cutters and glass it immediately goes into an order which is uh, uh, of the abstract which is what we would say at this point we could try to stay away from and look at because most of the even if you were to take uh, you know even if you were to take chai uh, at the galla and start looking at materials and tools uh, you will become abstract when you actually uh, get into it there will be systems which are about organizing uh, things that allow the chai to get there at a certain price and the minute you start talking about those kind of things it will be but in order to, and in some sense it's also i mean it to me it's uh, indicative of how how uh, <laughs> i'm sorry i'm just saying this out the way it comes to my head is how complicatedly we think Uh, i mean the, the it's simply a tool <laughs> i mean uh, and we are asking to look at a tool and we are thinking of all the consequences before looking at the tool and what it could uh, mean uh, so i i think again the the idea is to make us look simply at things around us uh, and a look at the core relationship between the body the context and the tool the place and the tool uh, and to strip it off of of this and to see also because you know a lot of many times uh, practice practices shift and with that entire meanings and entire connections shift uh, and and perhaps in really looking at tools from their ground zero one is able to recognize that there is a potential for shifting things very little if one simply looks at their potential of what they do Uh, and all the connections they make in that so the idea is to to kind of move away all the accepted kind of uh, relations and just look at them very simply any other questions people uh, want to clarify um if there are any um nagging doubts i have one if um is this tool or practice have to be related with the geography that we are thinking of this exercise exercise to a no no it does not have to be related okay okay um, it's <coughs> to also talk about the time available for doing these exercises now yes um so i mean uh, we we will have till the uh, we will have a week for this exercise so till the end of next week uh, we, we you will work on this uh, we will uh, uh, professor shay would you like to uh, uh, first discuss amongst us the the way that we are going to terminate these and then uh, maybe we can discuss with uh, put it out there that um don't say a week that's my only plea uh um, oh, right. we should we should really uh start pulling the the strands together much faster okay And i would say your basic thinking on all the three exercises and the basic uh, schematic uh, drawing or video or whatever it is should be ready i mean the first exercise should be ready today but the other exercises we should finish by monday 
to to the level where it only requires a final push in getting it together because i think we will need the time remaining time for creating a program and for creating the design already on monday we will be on the 30th no i think it's monday is yes okay. and that means that, that leaves us only about 15 days yeah for less and so the exercises are extremely important but also i think um remaining in the clouds about them is a way of creating an uncertainty sometimes i find that the push of time pressure leads to a a good realization yeah uh, otherwise you just worry and you keep on being non committal and you you get stuck also i think a lot of us do that and if we want to prevent that from happening we have to just say there it is yeah get going so i think uh, even even if there is lots of time available say next week i will still say that it is necessary to commit yourself to an idea and push it through without worrying too much about its correctness acceptability etc but it is the conditions that you are studying i think that that is something which is clear that you are studying at the physical phenomena and the relationships that they imply yeah even though we are going to discuss this rias later but still i i felt the need for no for no sir i actually the the uh, what i meant actually in a week's time was that in a week's time we should be uh, thinking about program and so all these exercises would be over by then and uh, really immerse in that process of uh, uh, of looking at uh, uh, delhi more directly Hmm. Does anybody have a sense of how these exercises might lead towards a program? Ayaz, at least making us think more and think uh, on a multi-narrative. a uh, manner rather than a mono narrative and i think that is itself a way to look at the program because once we start looking at another problem then we would never again look at it in a mono narrative rather than a multi narrative i would take that as one of the takeaways to look as a program i don't know the direct implication right now yeah. you know the the studio should be like life which throws all kinds of things at you and some point you have to take a decision yeah every day it happens to us yeah um so you have had the lectures four of them and each has turned your face somewhere yeah and each has also stimulated a kind of different understanding of uh, of uh, many things um in the same way the discussions in the rooms have also created a kind of um uh, churning of your so it is a time when too many things are in the air for a while that will continue but like in life you will finally have to decide whether you go to bombay or you go to nagpur or wherever yeah you will have to decide that and um, that is something which is coming very soon and all the experiences of this journey and of the you know uh, excavating of of ideas and understandings those all will become the paraphernalia with which we will look at program
Hmm. There's also another uh, another entry point into program. Priya, I'd like to ask you what you understand by the word program itself. Hmm. And uh, you know, uh, typically as architects, what do we consider program? That's a very fuzzy, fuzzy line, which I, which I just start every project with, and also when we discuss with uh, people, uh, yeah, it's uh, and yet uh, and, to and a very naive it set, it becomes a set of requirements. But uh, uh, to somebody, it's a set of aims and objectives. To somebody, it's uh, it's a it's a vision. To somebody, it's a uh, it's a dialogue, and uh, really, it is everything. and to somebody it's the conditions or to somebody it is like the circumstances until on on which a project is built so uh, it has many uh, such facets but uh, what happens is everybody just looks at one slice of it uh, rather every project in india just looks at one slice of slice of it and gets on the fifth gear and just goes on you know and then it just so, falls so, thud so uh, that's so, what i have so experienced let's, let's... Uh, let's look at some of the slices I, i'm a little bit carefully uh, i think it's important uh, you know like if you say it is about uh, uh, you know you, you you said it's about a vision okay so that's some, one for, sometimes it. it's a vision sometimes it it's is also, even a vision uh, it's it's also i'm taking the two extremes and then we can we can work within it and, and at the other end you said it's a set of requirements Yeah, you know, and uh, I, I think that uh, the the point I'm trying to come to is that uh, when one is looking at uh, requirements, one is looking at uh, uh, one is looking at what is needed. Uh, uh, how do we decide what is needed, uh, and how do we uh, look for what is needed? And I A think a set of inquiry start... is required for what is needed. So what happens yes. is to people who. at least in my experience people who come to uh, me that okay i need two bedrooms three, uh, one living room one thing i would say that you know let's not uh, start there i would say that uh, let's look at the verbs how do you eat how do you sleep where do you, what is the ambience you would like to sleep in what is the ambience you would like to read in what is the ambience you would like to play music in or you know what what are the verbs or what are the adjectives which come to your mind rather than rooms or categories and that's when things change in an indian context in many of the projects which are executed where people come to you with a set of like okay I, like for example the central vista they have told that 5000 square meters of this and 20000 square meters of this and but that's not the requirement right that's uh, that's only a requirement but that's not that's not the program and that's that's where it has ended up to such a bizarre solution that everybody is creeping up about it from a landscape architect to a hydrologist to a geologist to to everybody is creeping up about it but still as indians we have accepted it that this is what is going to be built of our tax payer money so uh, it's an apathy so so priya if, if i was to stick to the requirement and vision part of it and say that yeah i have to come to requirements and you said that you know when people come to you that there are certain uh, sorry, activity I, i'm using wait is it sorry sorry uh, uh, yeah you... am i am i audible hello yeah Can, am i audible okay. yeah 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 i'm audible i think priya is unfortunately yeah. Uh, yeah 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 okay no so i'm uh, what i'm saying is that if we have a set of requirements like you uh, said that you uh, you immediately take something that we consider a function uh, like a bedroom or a kitchen or so on and you take it into verbs okay and and in some sense we are doing very similar things when we talk about practices uh, we are doing very similar things when we talk about adaptive uh, strategies uh, we are trying to look at where the activities lie uh, and what are the activities that are uh, that shape things so these these exercises as as you were were talking about have direct uh, implications in the in the manner in which we can think about program it only uh, uh, will allow us yeah. to perhaps open up uh, what we consider as the usual requirements like you said the 25000 this and that uh, and see what it is and for whom those requirements are applicable uh, for whom are there tools when you put in an electric buggy to take you from place a to b and what are the uh, practices those will uh, allow 
uh, and what are the other kind of practices that we would like there when we think of uh, the central vista uh, etc so i mean there are direct uh, relationships to the between the exercise and the making of program if you start looking at program from activity upwards and of course there must be a vision because when all those activities come together they must form a world of sorts and there will be things and tools and people and and uh, trees and environment and so on and so forth in that one thing that to bear in mind one thing that we have to bear in mind is that a program is not something that is uh, ended uh, by the design by when you start design Uh, yes. that program is is clear and design so program should be as clear as possible but the design will always raise questions about it and the program in iterative ways will will transform as you go along even the vision which you first had will become questionable at certain points as your design evolves and so the program is a kind of uh, um a menu uh, with which you start something but which will evolve as it goes on huh hmm? so one one shouldn't be one shouldn't be too um too fossilized about making a clear thing the program is something which is open to development in kant's terms it would be the difference between form and design and when when he wants to talk about form he refers to things that he had experienced or seen or imagined in design form but yeah i actually such um, abstract discussions we love to do but have to be put to a stop somewhere also that uh, we will have a program end of next week we'll have a program yep we will have a vision a statement of uh, intentions etc 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 and it will also have a, a brief of a kind and then okay we'll kick that around and we'll learn from it and something else will happen but we started somewhere that that commitment i think design is a series of commitments as if one understood but that as if is very important that you have to to sort of be able to believe that i have already understood what is needed and that that uh, illusory space is what allows you to operate and how as you freeze <laughs> and i think that is something which i i would in all my years of teaching the only thing is that i've learned is how to prevent students from freezing that's the only thing that i have to do now nothing else we have time for one last abstract thing yeah sure <laughs> no uh, this is uh, I, i think uh, i mean i was just thinking about you know the interrelationship of uh, the of the singular practice and the city you know because they they seem to be two very different scales and uh, you know one of the uh, one of the kind of interesting uh, writings around actually the genesis of orobin uh, so this was like essentially writing from orobindo uh, where he's talking about uh, the idea of uh, uh, you working on your own yoga uh and uh, so so each each individual practitioner developing his or her practice uh, to the ultimate 
expression. Uh, so if you're a paper maker, you make just the best paper uh, that you can make uh, over and over again and repeatedly and you kind of hone your craft. And this city is actually then a manifestation of all these individual practices put together. Uh, and an atmosphere of excellence is created if every single practice has reached a level of, uh, you know, individual expression that is exalted or, uh, uh, I mean, so, I mean, essentially this, uh, this idea of, you know, multiple, multiple paths to the top of the mountain that you can actually achieve uh, some sort of enlightenment or some sort of exaltation by just doing whatever it is you're doing with a sense of mindfulness and a sense of flow. And, you know, there's so many other uh, kind of, so, I mean, yeah, just this kind of relationship of the city being a agglomeration of all these kind of uh, individual practices that tend towards ex excellence or I think we can end there and okay. sorry, Professor Chai, unless uh, you want to when you are please. I'm being the mountain. Yeah. All of you have to agree that this is a mountain. There is a tacit agreement that this is a mountain with a base and a peak. And then you take different paths to reach the top of the mountain. But the fact that there is a mountain is something that is emerging in the community of practitioners. And in the studio, one has to create the sense that there is a motive which is driving us all. Even if we are working in groups, each group will have to find its source of which is the mountain? Yeah. Is it a is it a sort of conical mountain or a rounded mountain? Is it a very steep or it's easy? They will have to find that. Then all all start working. But they are also able to see each other across the landscape. The the city is par excellence a social space in which you can see others. And others can make themselves visible and, and tangible to you. And that tangibility of, of various existences is something that the city tries to draw itself out of. It, the city becomes, by the, by the sort of uh, conversation of these tangibilities. And that, that conversation always requires and understandability, that you are doing something, I am doing something, we both understand what you are doing, you understand what I am doing. By understand, I don't mean able to explain, but I, I see sense in it. Yeah? And the, the real thing is, when we start being able to see some sense in each other's work, and this, this part of the studio which will come with that with the program and each one will, will find excellence, but which will be a common mountain and a shared conversation. I think these, uh, because Arvindo is of course, I mean, each one is there, they, they don't need language. And they, they can, uh, you know, they can communicate at another level, perhaps. Um, so his simile is a bit, bit, and th that is actually the problem of Auroville. The problem of Auroville is that there is a misunderstanding about what it means to have individual ex excellence while making a community. You should, if I have attended some of the major decision-making sessions about what to do next, <laughs> yeah. On that note, maybe we can uh, close this session and give people either the time to go back to their rooms and uh, continue conversations 
in that grouping or uh, to mull over tools, practices, and places.